I wonder what, I want to say again like I did earlier, I wonder what anions have to do with what we're doing. Because all I know is that I have a feeling that this whole mathematical graph theoretic formalism that relates to Lie algebras and gives us statistics, I have a feeling it has something to do with whatever topological quantum computers are. Feynman invented the conjecture of quantum computers. And Feynman says nobody understands quantum mechanics. And if nobody r understands quantum mechanics, then in some sense they don't deeply understand what all of the implications are of a quantum computer. It's kind of like, what is a subquantum mechanics computer? Like what deeper insights would we have as to what quantum co computation is that would come from a first principle subquantum mechanics and, qu and, and quantum gravity theory? Um, and furthermore, a topological quantum computer is even more exotic than what Feynman conjectured, and that was conjectured by Kidiev at Caltech. And, and both quantum computers and topological quantum cu computers now have some uh, experimental demonstration that, that it is possible. And so a topological quantum computer has to be operated on a topological phase of matter. There are several discovered topological phases of matter, but one of them is quasicrystals. So when you bring a quasicrystal at a, to a low temperature, but not too low, like liquid nitrogen, you, um, it actually enters into a topological phase of matter, which is defined as a state of matter that is, has an entanglement entropy that is exceedingly high. So it's a highly entangled system of particles, such that we define it as a topological phase of matter. So what if the whole space-time graph at the most fundamental level is a topological net. Okay, if it's a topological net, then whatever topological quantum computers are, they have, so all, top, all topological phases of matter are described quantum statistically by Fibonacci anions. Even if they use another type of anion, you can always reduce it to the irreducible form, which is the Fibonacci anionic form. Okay, so then maybe top, maybe Maybe, maybe, op maybe topological quantum computers, therefore, relate to Fibonacci anions. And if in some mathematically abstract sense, our formalism is topological quantum computing of a space-time net, a space-time topological quantum net as a space-time code, then what if this idea of the Fibonacci anions and this idea of, of the Fibonacci matching rules And, and Rayner and anybody else who's not aware of this, this, I'm not saying these are similar because of the word Fibonacci. These are exactly the same mathematical form. It's just, in other words, the, in other words if you want to know what the braiding rules, the fusion rules are for anions, I can just write down for you the form of the Fibonacci matching rules. It's just the same thing. So, um, so that is that. Now we're on to 8. So 8. Okay, so 8 is something we're hot on the trail on now, in the last few weeks, and that is uh, what is our game inertia? What does our game momentum mean? And for that matter, what is our game mass? So before I go into that, um, game, I, before I go into that, I can say quite innocently that one characteristic of mass is that it has the potential to experience inertia. I don't have to define mass that way, but I certainly can say that one of the characteristics of mass is that it can experience inertia upon acceleration. So, let's, so, so our game momentum is the idea that I talked about before, where this, a d over t, where d equals 10 and t 
equals 5 has an s value for the optimal saving section. In other words, this is a particular pitch of a particle. And if we assume some radius of the cylinder, then we can calculate some s value for the optimal saving section. If we have another one optimal saving section, wherein d equals 20, and let's say t equals 10, that means it's at a longer, oops, sorry. Okay, then, then this means that this one obviously is at a longer uh, pitch. The pitch is greater. So it's not having, so a given center emperor does not make as much contribution to other needed positions in the past or the future. So the overall S value for any quantity of center emperors is, uh, is less in this case. But this particle pattern gave you the information of much more uh, coverage or information of progression through space, which is good information. But this one gave you not much progression through space, but gave you lots of good information <coughs> as it cycles through internal clock time. And what does the internal clock time do? Like a water sprinkler on a lawn, it spits out a ruled surface called the empire wave all around it with more elements in its empire wave over those frames. In other words, let's say both of these are at 100 frames. Okay? This one is going to spit out much more density of pattern in the ruled surface of its EM field. And what does that what, is, what good does that do? That allows more interactions with local particles. More action in the field, more density of savings opportunity in the field of this one, okay, is allowing f more information of interaction. Like think about microscopic things, the interactions within a DNA molecule, the interactions within something very small. If you have more interactions, more dipole changes, more you know, more spin flips, more, just more accelerations, interactions. So with a, with a more dynamic and denser empire wave field, you have more action, more, int, more, more information of quantum state changes in an evolving multi-particle multi system. So it's not just that I'm abstractly saying that counting this internal clock cycles very abstractly and numerically is why I think this relates to our notion of time. Our notion of time relates to how much evolution of a system microscopically can occur over n frames of universal time. So, all right, so this S prime here is of a lower magnitude than this, right? So you would think that if, if you were thinking about this S index and probability, at first you would think, well, hey, wait a minute. If the system is supposed to statistically randomly choose on these s index columns according to s value well then if it's at this state at time if it's at this state at at time 1 oh uh, s is larger than s prime right yeah okay so in other words if if it is at s prime this is its its propagation, you know, through di through space versus time, and that's a bad. That's not a good S savings. That's not as good as this. So then, why doesn't it spontaneously decelerate to this? 
And that's part of the current problem that we're trying to demonstrate. So if, if, if to get to this value, so let's let S, let me make numbers out of this. I'm just going to make this magnitude of S 20, okay? And I'm going to make this magnitude of S 5, okay? Um, you can know that if you set this um, radius at X, this radius at X, this shape of this clock is the same as this charge, everything is the same, and the only intrinsic state variable you modify is the d over t value, which is the pitch. If you do that, then the one with the longer pitch, all else is equal now, will have a lower s value. So that's why I'm writing 20 and 5 to make my point, is that we have one case with a low, a high S value, one with a low S value, but this is where we're at at time one. This is our initial condition. So why doesn't it spontaneously have a probability to evolve toward this value, which would be a deceleration? In other words, when things are in a constant state of motion, why don't they decelerate in vacuum space? Okay, so Anyway, I've said it a couple times, so I'm just asking why doesn't it spontaneously um, go to the better savings value, okay? So, in other words, why do we observe momentum in physics? Why does a particle put placed in a rate of motion stay at that rate of motion in vacuum space until interrupted by a force? Why momentum? Okay, and why inertia? So, what what... What Fong and I believe is that there's some mechanism in, our, in the way our math works with these object savings that, that if you go back to this, the idea of the empire wave and the idea of an of a optimal saving section, if I place one center emperor in my clock and then another center emperor in my clock, I have not yet achieved the optimal saving section. Because at this point, I don't have any contribution from the past. Because there could have been, if I did have a past, a history, there could be center emperors and positions on the clocks in the optimal savings section back here that are helping me out up here, making contact with things up here. But I don't have that if I just started. So to, to really achieve the understanding of an optimal savings section, you need some minimal span of of your empire wave. Okay, you can take it to a very large distance and then you can say, oh, well, there's still stuff here and here that doesn't have a history here and doesn't have a future here, but then that becomes um, more trivial as the stuff in the middle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. These become rounding errors eventually. So you have to, you have to think about how the future states contribute. Now, the question is, if I've got a pattern here at a power of phi to the n, right? This is making contact here because this whole system here, its spacing, is phi to the power n. And up here in the future and in the past, it's phi to the power n, not m. So does phi to the power n somehow make better contact with phi to the power n than it would with a pattern at phi to the power plus or minus, you know, different than n, smaller or larger? Another idea that Fong has is related to the metaphor of a plasma wake field. And we, these are ideas she can share with us later, but there are at least two plausible ideas based on an intuition that when you truncate the history at a given power of phi, in other words, you decelerate or accelerate that what happens is now you've disassociated yourself from this, from this past. Also, and, and so, if that were true, and we have to demonstrate this, if that were true, then you would have a set of columns in the S index. So you do an acceleration event around here, and then you're going to get, in the future, at some column here, 
to a better S savings than this, but you have to dip down and go even lower than your current rate. I gave an example to Marcelo that I thought was stupid, which is, imagine there's this poor man and he lives on a block in a nice neighborhood and he has a wife and his wife beats him Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with a frying pan. And he has this woman next door who's really in love with him and he really wants to divorce his wife and have a new life and a family with this woman who's never going to beat him. There's only one problem. The brother and the father of the woman who beats him have vowed that they will beat him to near death if he divorces their sister and their daughter. So on the one hand, he can get to this new utopia with the new girl and have a life without being beat, but in order to get to that life, he has to go through a dip and go into an even worse state because they'll beat him up worse than his wife beats him up. So the point is, is in order, in order, that's, I told you it was stupid. In order, in order for this, the conjecture is, in order for this to transition to the land of milk and honey, where it can get this juicy savings of 20 instead of five per, per period, it's going to have to go through some pain. And that will be represented numerically in columns on the S index. Or, or, or it'll, be, it'll be squares in columns, right? There will be a sequence of high probability states that have a worse S value than what it was enjoying when it was enjoying its contribution from a history at that power of phi that integrated better with, with that power remaining constant with this idea of momentum. Now, if this is true and something is accelerated by the RSV, the relational state variables with another particle, which is the field, um, then in many cases, um, we will be able to interpret this period of pain, this dip to even lower S savings. We can interpret this with phrases like computational drag. That is, over a fixed number of frames or shift vector actions, we are simply not going in those transition periods where S drops below its, its former steady state level when S drops, what else drops? Pattern creation. When, when S drops, you need more center emperor positions to express both forward propagation in space and internal clock time, which predicts that under acceleration, our particles must time dilate. That is, their internal, their internal uh, frame of reference, their internal clock has to have a drag under acceleration and their power to propagate over a fixed number of frames in space also has to experience a drag. And that, those two forms of drag we can call game inertia. So we have game momentum, which is just the statistical probability of the man on the block to stay with his wife because it's the lesser of evils, even though he could get to the, the better situation if he were to suffer pain. But the PL doesn't work like that. The PLs, oftentimes, at least this aspect of the PL, is looking at near-term opportunity, not thinking so much about opportunity way out here. To think about opportunity way out here and violate quantum statistics, you'd have to introduce humans or other animals that have other motivations and intentions for long-term goals. And then the S values and, and what happens starts happening according to the chosen higher levels of meaning other than the simplistic physical meaning of propagation through space and internal clock time economically. So quantum statistics therefore is about conservation of momentum and paths, paths of least action and whatnot. It's about conservation of energy for the purpose of expressing particle propagation through time and space. So, all right, so I've given a suggestion of what game momentum and its kind of inverse relation, you know, it's inverse object in game um, inertia. Uh, 
I do strongly suspect we will get game momentum and game inertia. Whether or not those are physically realistic is another story, but I'm pretty sure we'll get a game momentum and inertia. So back to mass. So for me, if you say, Klee, in the game, what do you want to call mass? I want to call, first of all, I need a thing in the game that has the potential to experience inertia and momentum. And the only thing I know in the game that can experience inertia and momentum is something that can slow down its clock. Like I need something with a clock, so I need, I need my game fermions, which could be, I can have more than one clock shape, and I can have more than one cylinder that defines a different mass for a given shape, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But but that's what, that's, what I, that's what my massive particles are. My massive particles have clocks. And they have the ability to have the inertial drag on time and propagation in the ways that I described it. They have the ability to have momentum. And they have these fields around them that have these few binary sign values. These are my masses. These, these are my, my toy idea of a fermion. And so... If I wanted a word like mass, I would say, if it has a clock, I call it a mass. And one of the qualities of my mass is that it has the uh, potential to experience game inertia and game momentum. It also has this quality of being able to attract things through its empire beams that run down the center axis and are probably beams of four groups so that chirality is an issue and, um, and, that, and where that force would average out to 1 over r squared. So that's my, my definition of mass. This definition of mass would also curve time, uh, curves, it would curve space in the following way. We talked about these beams, but we talked about them earlier on the whiteboard, and the whiteboard was frozen, and I was just using one beam in one direction, but that's not how these beams will be. These beams, everything is rotating, again, every black hole, every planet, every sun, every particle, everything is in rotation and helical propagation, and so these beams coming out of planets, they're forming these complicated S1 S2 related, sweeping, beautiful, ruled surfaces. And so these weak beams that drop like 1 over R squared and have this attractive, statistically attractive only quality will create these arced ruled surfaces. And everything, they, those arced ruled surfaces will instruct other particles statistically how to move. And they will always move in curvy paths, ellipticals, geodesics, spirals, toroidal shapes. They're always going to be, be doing that as though the space-time is curved. And it is curved isomorphically, again, with our quantum of curvature in the form of our positive and negative folding value, rotation twist value. So that's it for ideas on game, mass, momentum, and inertia. So the next one is number nine, and that is when there is a delta to mass, there is a delta to the d over t. So that'll be a, an elaboration of what we just talked about. We say that a mass is the potential to have uh, drag. And we can say that drag is a quantity, an integer. That is, it's related to a loss of frame savings. But a loss of what frame savings? It's a loss of the frame savings from the self-interaction. So if I have, a, now I can call it a mass because it's my game mass. This whole clock thing that we've been discussing is a mass and it has a constant average of object savings. Because at its d over t, flowing in its momentum, interacting like a plasma wake field or guide wave with its own self-interaction, it's almost riding its future and its past.
right, in the ruled surface over time. So this is a nice thing, isn't it, this momentum? This is a, a nice, comfortable flowing on its own ruled surface, effortless, no forces from the outside needed. It continues at that rate, on and on until interrupted. And the particle itself down at the Planck scale is weaving like a braided flowing thing into this ruled surface that's S1, S2 tensor product related. And so call that an S value. And the S value for that particle depends on its cylinder size. So whatever its constant self-interaction S value is, that you get to an average after it's been going for a long enough distance to have a nice history to contribute, is some value. Now, if I were to shrink down that cylinder, that S value changes, right? Because the whole structure requires more center emperors. There can be different, a different level of savings. So whatever the savings is that it has at its self-interaction for a given mass, that is the amount that it can lose, right? Like, let's say I make more money than you, Dugan. Who has more potential to lose money? Who has, who has a potential? <laughs> which of us has a greater potential to lose a larger magnitude of money? You. Right. So a, a particle that has a greater interaction of S savings at its optimal savings section structure, which is going to always be in a state of momentum, when it's saving a lot, okay, because of its structure, it will have a greater opportunity to have higher magnitude of inertia or f computational drag. So we've got two different ways that we can manipulate mass. We can take a single species of our clocks or masses, and we're going to say it has a cylinder size, okay? So we're going to call this. Just think of this as the one you've been working on, everybody. So you've got this one thing, and it's set at some cylinder size. And let's just call that an electron. So we're going to call that an electron. And um, now, I'm going to make another one. So I'm keeping the same shape of clock. And I'm going to keep the same d over t. But I'm just going to make another version of that that has a different cylinder. And I'll call that a tau electron. So it has a, 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 a different mass. It is, it is a bigger cylinder, so there's way more uh, center emperor positions that you need in the first place. And at the optimal saving section, there's probably going to be a lot more savings that you have, because it needed more. And then let's say I make an even bigger one, and I call that the, the mu electron. So I have, I, I can have... Same pitch but different radius. Uh, same pitch but different radius. So now the second way that I can manipulate mass is for any one of these three generations, I can say, all right, now I want to change the relativistic mass of each one by manipulating its pitch. So I take this one, and I stretch out its pitch so that the S value goes lower. And because the S value is lower, it has less potential to lose S value. So I can manipulate the relativistic mass by the, by the method of changing its d over t. And I can manip manipulate the intrinsic mass by changing the radius of the cylinder. So maybe relativistic mass is not the term that I should use. Because one thing is that the particle moving faster has more ability to impact another particle energetically and create accelerations. So we need to look at the simulation and see if the ability to have loss of, of S value um, occurs or not before I put labels on it. And then ask, all right, so 
that still can be moving faster and have more opportunity to impact things, right? Influence things, accelerate other things um, when we figure out more about what that means. Kind of ideas that we're going to be chewing on. These are not meant to be preaching to you that this is, you know, at all how, how for sure these are. These are a series of ideas that some are developed in my mind to a 30% level, some I'm really confident in, some I'm just totally not confident in. It's a hodgepodge. But this is my mixtape. This is my best of that I want us to work on and not get distracted by a lot of other things uh, until we do these things. Um, now, as far as species of mass, so we have a story here of three generations of mass, and then we need to have more than one clock. That is, we need to have a completely different kind of clock. And someday we need to understand, well, why would it be three families of mass and three generations? Because clearly I could make my cylinders all kinds of different sizes. So why would it be three generations of mass? I don't know. Why would it be three shapes? You know, because different clocks are like different shapes. Um, and I don't know. But I know that we can make different shapes. Like you can do a clock that has 20 periodicity on the S1 component. You can do clocks that have some correspondence to cube octahedra. You can do clocks that have correspondence to the tetrahelices, the three five, you know, the t patterns in the tetra. You can build a lot of different types of, of clock-like patterns uh, than the one where focused on now. Um, and so we're going to have to do some clock explorations of just different cool game of life style clocks here that we make and understand the S values and the pro properties of different clocks. But as our program gets more sophisticated and we learn more about um, clocks, enough to form opinions about what's a stupid clock and what's a cool clock, you know, and reduce things down a little bit, which we just don't have that knowledge right now. Um, that, that the goal, though, is to, is to some point in the future understand why the three families and the three generations of mass. So, so the next one is photons. So just by fast, fast review. So I've talked about general relativity and special relativity. With respect to general relativity, I've discussed how the um, how these systems of empire waves will create ruled surfaces from microscopic particle ruled surfaces that you can call the electromagnetic field to vastly larger ones. Um, and if you got a group of fermions to all rotate in a planetary body brought together by gravity and then rotating on an axis in one direction and then having that axis, uh, that rotating body moving around the sun in a wobbly helical path through around the, the sun, what happens is all of that curvy order creates gigantic patterns of ruled surface that on average smooth out to be beautiful curved paths that are going to cause, that are going to instruct how fermions that are brought into the vicinity of that field are going to follow geodesic-like paths and flow into that super field of, of the pattern of ruled surface around an entire rotating planet, rotating around its sun, and so on and so on, with curvature contributions from Mars, from the moon and so on, all in a gigantic interacting space that is equal to curvature because how you order the plus and minus quanta of curvature, of three space curvature in the isomorphism of twist, how you order those orderly creates ruled surfaces. If there's no order, there is no ruled surface. A ruled surface is by definition an orderly pattern over time. Uh, or just space, if you want to. So, um, so, that's, so that's why general relativity will have at this deep mathematical core some, some relationship to actual three-space curvature, but we're going to quantize it. 
And when we order our quanta in, in coherent patterns, we will get grand patterns that cause particles to arc into them along geodesics. But if we look at what they're built of, they're built of twist in an orderly non-chaotic pattern that creates these instructions to particles that are ultimately built of, of what you can call a deficit angle equivalency, a space-time, a three-space curvature equivalency, but is really a twist isomorphism. So, um, so a photon. So what, what do I want to call, so we have this helix and cylinder, and then outside the cylinder, these things never end. It drops off to the end of the universe, dropping like 1 over r squared. It's complicated. It's S1 cross S2 tensor product structure. What do I want to call this stuff? Like, what do I want to label as the building block of this empire wave thing that can cause other things to flow into it along geodesics? I could call it a lot of things. I could call them tetrahedra plus instances of plus and minus space-time curvature. Or I could call them, I could take surfaces on the foliations, because these things layer out, they feather out. I can take a surface on that foliation, which is like a discretized Ramanian surface, right? So planes, two-dimensional planes in the foliated structures of this empire wave. That curved Ramanian discretized surface has local near neighbor distances uh, that are Dirichlet integers. So it is a Dirichlet integer, aperiodic pattern distributed over a curved two dimensional surface, surface as each foliation. I could do that if I wanted. Um, so there are various ways, but how would I call them photons? Like, <clears throat> You know, we think about electromagnetism and we want to talk about the photons of the electromagnetic field. So in what sense would I call them photons and what do I think a photon might be in our game here? Well, I can start by saying, um, so I've got a ruled surface here. If this went on forever, Okay, it would just go on forever, but they never go on forever. Things are constantly being accelerated by the noise that we're going to find that is um, uh, analogous to a kind of Dirac C idea. Things don't go in, the, things don't get to cruise in a state of momentum in the unitary evolution for very long before they get disrupted. They're lucky if they can go some number of n nice run, okay. Um, and so what's happening, so what happens though, when we get these interactions from other particles, empire waves that are constantly changing their, their directions, their dipole rotations, and their d over t ratios, what's happening is we're having these empire wave fields here that are reaching forward in time to the drop-off point, right? So the drop-off point happens out here, but then, and it's going back this way and dropping off, but the thing is, is this is a, a short-lived period of momentum. So what happens is by changing it, changing its direction, changing its d over t, now it's going to create a new electromagnetic field where the electromagnetic field is explicitly expressed by the helicity, by the d over t ratio, by whatever spin is in our model, and so on. But what about the old stuff that reached forward into the future. In other words, at time three, it's going to be accelerated or rotated, right? But the empire wave goes out to time, to time four and on to time, you know, 50 or whatever. And it also existed and also exists back here. So what happens when I've got this short lived period of momentum at from T T1 to T3, and I've got this history back here at negative T1 you know, and, and going back this way and going forward. It seems to me that it creates a truncated patch or packet of this empire wave. It's no longer part of something that gets to go on forever. This packet 
here is like a standalone thing. And maybe it's back here too. But what do I do with this thing here? Because remember, energy in this program is the order within the set. Or you may say energy is the ruled surface of these patterns. If we disorder the set of shift vectors, then we have a beautiful homogeneous noise where it's so smooth, it's so almost smooth, that a particle in it will be instructed in one Planck moment to go this way, and then another moment to go that way, and there'll be just no coherency whatsoever. So it really won't go anywhere on average. And so there will really be no real energy. Like we wouldn't model that as game energy. We would model that as ideal vacuum, but with the noise. So energy is order or ruled surface, and that's what this is. This is ruled surface. Uh, and if I really think it's ruled surface, right, and I really believe that ruled surface offers opportunities to be the energy landscape to determine the random walks for the evolution of propagators in the system, then a propagator coming in contact with this packet, it's going to be instructed to flow according to the ruled surface, how it gears, how it's going to interact. It is going to change the random walk probabilities for some particle making contact with it, getting close to it. And that particle will specifically flow into this ruled surface, this truncated wave packet, um, in geodesic-like paths. And so I want to call that a free photon, game photon, it is a wave packet. It is energy, if you allow me to define energy, as something that is a ruled surface that can influence the behavior of another particle. This is a ruled surface, which means this is energy bound in the form of matter. And this is not a clock, but this is energy, bosonic energy, in the form of patterns in space-time. But then again, that's patterns in space-time too. I mean, that's patterns in our graph space. So, all right, so I feel okay speculating that this wave packet can influence other particles. It can do work on other particles. It will have something related to the helicity, right? So we know photons have polarity, like there's binary values in photons, like polarity. I haven't thought a lot about it compared to the clocks. But we're going to probably have something that are like these truncated wakes. Like imagine a speedboat going and then it takes a wicked, you know, 45 degree angled turn and just rips to the left. And then this wake field that it had previously is now truncated. And it just keeps, it's just there to interact with other boats and other things. So then we've got two forms of photons then. If we're going to call this ruled surface that's truncated as a wave packet a free photon, then these guys are not so free. These ones that are, that are still part of, of the clock, if we wanted to say, all right, well, where do we cut this off? Let's cut the clock off at the cylinder. And we say where all the center emperors have to go is at positions in the, in the cylinder. And this is, this, is our, this is our matter. Right? This is our mass, this is our thing that we're calling the fermion, and then all of this stuff that can never be disconnected from it is also pattern in mathematical information, and we're going to call that the energy field that we can also call photons of a different form because they're not free, they're not packets like this one. Okay, just an idea on photons and energy. So now we're almost done. So we've gotten to point 13 on the list. And now uh, we're at gravity. But we've talked a lot about gravity <clears throat> prematurely. So we uh, talked about the axis. I did the whole you know, story about the axis of the helices. We talked about why things would move in, in, in kind of elliptical paths or geodesic-like paths. 
We talked about quanta of curvature in Ray and Fong, I mean, um, Richard and Fong's paper, and this idea that maybe we're going to end up having a quantum of, space, of three space curvature. That is our fundamental building block. And if we want to say, if we ever wanted to say that gravity is curvature, then that means everything in our model is made of gravity. What is the clock made out of? It's made out of curvature. It's made out of non-deformed chunks of Euclidean three space in tetrahedra that are glued together or related to other tetrahedra by quanta of curvature of three space into four dimensions. Our photons would be made of that same two objects, curvature and chunks of Euclidean three space as tetrahedra. So in some sense, everything would be made all of our game physical processes and objects would be made of that same two ingredients, the three space curvature and the, um, the three simplices. Um, we talked about, we did not finish talking about why the average curvature would be flat. So we have some papers, and if anybody's mathematically inclined, we have a paper called the sum of squares law, and we have another paper called the sum of areas, volumes, and hypervolumes law. It's just the same, it's extension of the sum of squares law. It's very beautiful and elementary, but basically when you think about projecting or compressing something that's symmetric, so you have this symmetric thing like a, like a, a Lie lattice, you know, that has symmetric root vector polytopes, and then you try to compress it down through projective geometry to a lower dimension. And there's this conservation under our sum of squares observation that however everything contracts, right? So you have an infinity of irrational angles that you can project this thing to, or you can rotate it while it's being projected and get all these different forms of contraction, okay? Um, but where one thing expands and becomes less contracted from the rotation, another thing must, comp must com um, compensate by being more contracted. The, the total contraction of edges must always be conserved under any rotation of the projection. And so what we do is we get all of this contraction and curvature when we go from E8 to 4D, but then we take a three-dimensional Euclidean slice of this four-dimensional object, and then we compound it, it with clones of itself in three spatial dimensions, and instead of allowing contraction to express that geometric curvature or frustration from 4D to 3D, we force the isomorphism of twist by arc co cosine one quarter minus arc cosine one half. And by taking that four dimensional twist angle that we get from four dimensions and applying it in the compound, what we're really doing is in all junctions of tetrahedral, all relationships between four groups, they're all related by the, three d by the four dimensional curvature angle that is the same as, in other words, if I have one tetrahedron in, in four in, in uh, Elser Sloan quasi crystal, regular old 3D tetrahedron, and then I want to rotate a copy of itself on the axis of its fast face. So I'm now rotating a copy of itself into the fourth dimension. So that angle that I have to rotate is arc cosine one quarter. So, in a sense, that is the angle that you can think about as deeply relating to the curvature with, with respect to tetrahedra of one three space and then bringing the tetrahedron copy into another three space where the two in their relationship either need four dimensions to live in, if you do it as full rotation into the fourth dimension, or which or, which is like curving a three space into the four dimension, fourth dimension at the axis, at the axis point of the um, face center, or instead alternately find the twist isomorphism. Um, so, 
something about why it would all average as flat I means certainly we're using Euclidean slices and we're doing and we're doing expressing our curvature with the twist and the Euclidean slice comes from 4D and we've already done the compression from 8D to 4D so we've already taken care of all of that curvature and now we start in 4D with a Euclidean space that is the space that we take the three-dimensional slice of Elser Sloan is flat Euclidean three space. So and then we covered why we discussed before lunch, or maybe it was no after lunch. We discussed why it would be attractive. That was a complicated, so I have no idea how much what each of you understood. I don't think everybody would have understood the same level. Um, we we have not talked about an equivalency principle, but um, in the game physics, if I'm in an elevator and I get accelerated upwards by the elevator, um, I'm going to experience what I would think of as, as game drag, right? Simulation drag. And the reason is because I'm being accelerated by repulsive forces. So it's the van der Waals forces of the electrons and the other particles in my shoes and in the floor of the elevator that are pushing up against me. They're, trying, they're moving, they're being accelerated by some engine in the elevator. And so they're, they're having drag, but then they're taking that out on me and pressing against my, my uh, empire waves in my feet. And the, and the bad gearing that Fong talks about is occurring. And that's the Van der Waal, that is the um, Coulomb forces. So, the, so electromagnetically, these Coulomb forces, which are these repulsive uh, relational state variables, are pushing up on me, forcing me into these accelerations, causing me to lose my electron self-interactions, okay? switching back and forth between real-world ideas and the game physics. So in the game physics, I'm going to because this is a repulsive relationship. In other words, I'm just trying to get away from them. My, my empire waves, my electrons are trying to get away from those ones that are the bad gearing. Why is it trying to get away? Where is it going, by the way? It's trying to get back to its own electron self-interaction because its own interaction with itself is like this safe little bubble where it can ride its own wake field, it ride its own efficiency by writing its own future and past at that momentum, at that d over t. And the best way to do that in this case with the bad gearing is to get as far away from those as possible. So the s index values will show that random walks in the opposite direction getting away will be of higher probability. But if that was, if, if there were attractive, if there wasn't Coulomb forces, if it was the other side of the Coulomb barrier where the force flips from repulsive to attractive, right, at the radius just less than the Coulomb radius, then all of a sudden the gearing would flip to attractive and there would be better opportunities to gear in to those empire waves even better than my own electron self-interaction. So it's always like this competition between the electron self-interaction in the game versus opportunities to gear with other empire waves in RSVs that are, let's call it, constructive or helpful. So you can see this deep similarity between what I said about gravity. So as, you, as, as, you, as you're falling into a gravitational field, you're not experiencing at a constant rate of acceleration in a constant gravitational field. Well, then in that case, you're in free fall. So you're not experiencing, none of my empire waves should be experiencing any drag. Why? Because they're being attracted into gearing. So they're okay changing their d over t, losing the economy of their self-interaction by changing pitch, right, to longer pitches. They're okay with that because they're being paid back by the gearing, by the good RSVs that are offering even better object savings. So in that case, they would not experience G-forces or inertia. In that case, 
in free fall into a gravitational field, they would, they would, have, they would have a sense of, uh, uh, of weightlessness or, or, or the same feeling that they have when they're in a state of inertia with no computational drag. But then when they make contact with the Earth, then they're going to feel what I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling g-forces because of the because of the Coulomb forces. My this gravitational attraction is trying to accelerate me toward the center of the Earth, and yet the Coulomb forces from the bad gearing of all of the layer of electrons near the soles of my feet are pushing up on me and then they're trying to accelerate other layers of 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 empire waves throughout my body and my and the whole thing I'm just feeling this whole all these part all these empire waves being sucked toward the center of the earth trying to be accelerated that direction and then I'm getting this competing force against me from the bad gearing of the of the electrons right the coulomb forces of the badly geared RSVs so it doesn't feel good because it's putting compression on my spine and it's just making me feel heavy, right? Uh, but but that's, that's the animals that we are, right? We, we can't survive without gravity. I mean, we, our muscles would atrophy, right? Our bones would break. Okay, so there's, um, there's a kind of way in the game understanding that I have from this simple ideas of the empire waves that I can start to think like what is the similarity between the g-forces that I feel when an elevator pushes me up versus the g-forces that I feel as the as the earth pulls me down against those repulsive forces right um, so um, our model would not seem to imply um, a black hole singularity because we're still talking about gravity um, and that's for one really obvious reason is that we don't we don't have the conjecture that a fundamental particle is a dimensionless point that's one and the other is that from what I'm gathering in my visualizations I don't see how these two empire waves can occupy, can just converge into one another. Like these fundamental ones that are like the electrons, for example, I just don't see how they just pull into each other. They, they, they're going to have this bad gearing. So at some point when the density of the beams of gravity is so dense because these guys get closer together, closer packed, so to be closer packed, they have to withstand the bad gearing because they have these they don't the, if it's a if it's a positive and a positive clock they're going to have bad gearing right they're not the random walk probabilities to be closer together will be low and the random walk probabilities to be further apart will be high but if you could get a lot of them very close together then they would start having a lot of these empire beams that are the center axes points that drop like 1 over r squared, the gravity story, right? And that would start to com compete at a certain limit. But there's some limit where I don't see that they could get, like in real life, two electrons will never get very close because these, these at, at Planck scale levels of distance, right, these Coulomb fields of the bad gearing will always give very low S index values for them to get so close. But if they could be really close, like in a gravitational collapse, they could get as close as not interpenetrating one another. And these electrons, as we're drawing them, are Planck scale. If the tetrahedral edge length is Planck length, then our empire wave is something like, could be a diameter of five Planck lengths. Like they are very, very, very small. And when you take a huge number of them and try to imagine them that small, and then get them into a very small kind of limit, a close packing kind of idea, then what you can have is you can have an enormous number of these empire waves fall into the singular, into the event horizon of a black hole where the Coulomb force is virtually overwhelmed 
right? Our version of a Coulomb force is virtually overwhelmed and these things are just brought in as close as they can be. Um, so what you would have is a limit, not a singularity. If a singularity implies zero, then this is not a singularity. This is a limit where there's a limit to how close they can be. And it's almost like the idea of a neutron star, but it's like an electron star instead of a neutron star. So you have all these fundamental particles, right? So neutrons are not fundamental particles. So if you have all these fundamental particles compressed down, where all the neutrons, which have mostly empty space in them, are compressed down to their Planck scale fundamental particles, now you have something far, far, far more dense than a neutron star. And in fact, in the game, you have the absolute limit of fermionic density that the game would allow if, if this is what emerges. Okay? <clears throat> so the game does predict a kind of limit in just, you know, in my imagination, a limit of fermionic density or close packing in the metric space of the QSN. And if such an object could really form in our game physics, it would put out the highest possible density of empire of these center axis beams that drop like one over R squared. It would put out for a given volume, it would put out the highest density possible, right? Because you can't pack these empire waves in this story any closer. So it would be the gravi it would be the gravitational maximum possible for a given volume. So gravity, gravi the gravitational theory uh, and its relationship to um, the golden ratio. So if our game ever produced realistic physics, right, realistic gravitational physics and quantum physics, then obviously because the whole game is based on Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio power series and Dirichlet integers, well then obviously the golden ratio is going to be part of the equations of such a new physics. And so I always keep my eye on the equations of Davies and Rovelli and Marcello because these three beautiful equations in the case of Davies, um, let me go back over here, Davies assumes thermodynamics to be true. Davies assumes uh, general relativity to be true. And so that means He's assuming he's using in his equation on the left side uh, the gravitational constant, and um, he's using uh, <coughs> Boltzmann's constant. What's the symbol for Boltzmann's constant? S. Okay. Anyway, he's he's got on his left side of the equation some symbols that fundamentally uh, are about the gravitational constant, and you know general relativity and thermodynamics. And then on the right side of the equation, uh, he has the golden ratio. Now it's a lot more complicated than what I'm saying. It relates, it relates to the specific heat and a phase transition uh, that one could imagine and um, where the phase transition is a kind of special limit or special thing. It's not just some arbitrary thing. And it's really quite remarkable and unexpected that the golden ratio comes out because there's really nothing about the theory of entropy or thermodynamics or the theory of general relativity that has anything to do with the golden ratio. So why is it then that you, when you create the relationship between the limit, by the way, it's the limit. So it's the limit, it's in black hole. This is a black hole equation. So it's assuming general relativity to be true using the gravitational constant and then assuming at the limit of it, where things kind of clean up at the limit, and then the limit of thermodynamics in a black hole, then everything cleans up. And at the end of the day, you're really thinking about ratios. Because when you put symbols on the left in equations, no matter how you're doing it, whether it's powers, you know, fractions, in, you know, multiplications, anything you do with the symbols on the left, 
is really at the end of the day about the relationships between the, these fundamental con uh, constants, right? The mathematical relationships. So over on the right, so beautifully, whatever it is about these relationships, okay, that we don't fully understand what these values are, by the way, like nobody knows what the gravitational constant is, like we know it to about the fifth decimal place, and we have no analytical expression for it. We have no analytical expression for Planck's constant, and we have, and we have no uh, analytical expression for the speed of light, right? We have, we have no way to measure with absolute precision the speed of light. We don't have an idea of what an analytical expression would be from first principles. So the fundamental constants are all known to different resolutions, like in this case, the fifth decimal place, and, and so all we can do without having any first principles deep understanding of why these fundamental constants have the values they have is we can say, all right, maybe we can get some deep insights by comparing the ratios, right, between these fundamental values. And when Davies does that at the limit of thermodynamics and gravitational theory, at the limit in a black hole, the physical limit, he gets on the right side of the equation golden ratio. So then. Marcello here, and then um, one of the fathers of loop quantum gravity, Carlo Rovelli, uh, they do it in a more sophisticated way because they assume Planck's constant uh, to be true and all of quantum mechanics, therefore, to be true. And they assume general relativity to be true and they use this and they, and they use C. And then they use the Emersi parameter What's the symbol for the Mersey parameter? How's it go? Right. So it's a little more complicated than this. There may be squares, there may be other stuff, but it's basically, you know, these big boys, big time constants, right? Uh, these are the three fundamental constants that rule them all, right? From, from these three, you can take, or you can take any two of these three and derive the third. And from the deep aspects of understanding these three, you can get all of the other uh, constants, such as um, fine structure constants and cosmological constants and so on. So this Emersi parameter is something more sophisticated, and it's a kind of, I believe that some of these things are kind of, um, fixes, like the gravitational constant, as I really think about it, I think, oh, well, the whole problem is they're using two these different arbitrary man-made metrics. So, so they've got this metric, metric, they got a completely different metric, and they're both arbitrary and man-made, and it's as though the gravitational constant is a number that represents the reconciliation of these man-made metrics, right? And, and and it's deep, though, because no matter, it doesn't matter what the metrics, if you're using the same metric, then you can take two values and, and, have, and have a ratio that's really deep and tells you something so that it wouldn't necessarily matter how, that you've used a man-made metric. But you just use the same metric and you've got a ratio that, that's a deep number, a deep thing. But if you use two different man-made metrics, it gets more messy and that's how I see the gravitational constant. Point is, is that in both Rovelli's equation and Marcello's equation, they get phi, or 1 over phi, or some very simple expression with phi. In uh, Marcello's expression is much shorter. It has just three symbols on the left, or some, I think three symbols on the left, and golden ratio on the right. But the point is, is here, here is a laboratory. Black hole physics is a thought laboratory because it's the limit of thermodynamics. Special, it's the limit of quantum mechanics. It's the limit of, of general relativity. It's the limit of thermodynamics. And all three of these series are very deep and important and part of the picture. And so you go to black hole equations and you manipulate them and you can learn and think through, find, through cleaning things up, through going to limits. And, um, and, 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 and so it's, I think, as our the if we could at some point in this year get our theory it, it, it more quickly evolved, like instead of going at the same pace we went last year, we increase the pace and move a lot faster so that by, this ha by halfway through the year, 
we've got some way more deep insights about whether any of my story today is true and any new stories that are, that are good. Um, but at some point, this might be low-hanging fruit because it's just right here waiting for us to pick something about the unification of quantum mechanics and the unification of space-time theory has something to do with the golden ratio. Um, and nobody knows why, because nobody knows really what the fundamental values are with precision or analytical expression, uh, or, or for that matter, why they are what they are, even if we had analytical expressions. Uh, and so the, the purpose of this game is to start uh, understanding why and the fundamental constants are what they are from first principles. We want the game simulation to force the constants upon us, not us plug them. <laughs>